management. I'll, I'll start off by saying that the skin is the largest organ in the, bone, in the body. So you have non-fatal burn injuries, which can be a very, very large cause of morbidity and difficulty. And then, um, perfect. Okay, just had a look at the chat. And um, burns are preventable and they mainly occur in the home and the workplace. And then major burns usually may need multidisciplinary care in the ITU. So different teams helping out um, and multiple referrals. Oh, someone's raised their hand. Does anyone have a question? Um, no, yeah, Mum, I just uh, wanted to say something about the burn. Yeah, I of course. Could. Yeah, so basically, uh, burn is a coagulative necrosis of uh, the tissue, skin tissue, basically, because of any external uh, factor. And that uh, burn is basically, yes, a uh, kind of trauma. Yes, that's actually a very, very, very good definition. I've got that written in my slides a bit further down the line, but that is a very, very, very good definition of a burn. Um, there are multiple levels to it, but I'd say at the base, that is the main definition. And um, there are multiple causes we'll be covering a bit further down, but that is a very good definition. Um, so yeah, you can they can also range from mild to life-threatening. Thank you for that. Um, so the incidents, obviously, because I'm in London, I've got um, British figures, but I also found some worldwide figures. Um, in a 2018 study, they found that 180,000 deaths occur every year by burns, roughly estimated. Um, it largely occurs in low and middle income countries um, and then 300 deaths per year in the UK are actually caused by burns. I've actually seen burns in A&E as well. And then the most common group affected by burns, so around 50 percent is usually children aged one to five years. And then the next common group is usually elderly patients over 65 years. Um, also, if at any point anyone has questions, do feel free to raise your hand. Okay, so patient survival. This, I'd say, this is one of the most important things to learn because this is um, very, very important when you see patients present in terms of understanding um, how bad the burn is. So if you take a patient's age and the percentage of the burn, if it's over 100, there is a very good chance of death. So the patient is unlikely to survive the burn injury. Um, and then we have these figures here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but these figures show Wallace's rule of nines. Wallace was a doctor who published this and he found that um, different parts of the body can account for different percentages. And this is the easiest way to remember how much of the body is burnt in terms of total body surface area. So the head and the neck, front and back, is 9%. Each arm is 9%. Um, the front of each leg is 9%, the back of each leg is 9%, the anterior chest is 9%, the posterior chest 9%, and then you have the abdomen split as well, and then 1% um, for the uh, genitals. And then we also have the rule of palm. So the rule of palm is more if someone presents with a small burn and you want to assess in terms of total body surface area, the percentage. So as a rule, we roughly say that the whole front of the hand um, to the palm aspect, including your fingers, is 1%. Um, it's not accurate for burns over 15%, which is why we use a rule of nine, but I think it's a good way to assess small um, areas. And then in children, the rule of nine changes to rule of 10. So yeah, that's something that I think is very important. And I think if you're going to take something away from this, this is one of the main things. Wallace's rule of nines and in terms of patient survival, the age and the percentage burn in terms of, oh, sorry, I didn't realise I've just drawn over this. And, and the percentage um, burn and whether it's over 100 or not. Okay. Oh, I don't know how to undo this. Um, Okay, I'm so sorry, I don't know how to erase the lines I've made.
Okay, well, I'm just going to continue with the lines. I'm really sorry about this. Um, I got a bit carried away. So in terms of classification, so as one of your colleagues said previously, burns involve a coagulative destruction of the surface layers of the body. I think that's the most basic definition. And then um, we'll go into the pathophysiology a bit later. But it can, there are three ways you can classify burn. And I think these are three very, very important questions you need to ask yourself when someone presents with a burn. So the depth, the percentage body surface area, which we've covered, and then the etiology, so the different causes. And I think someone's put in the chat that it can be caused by burns and a few other things as well. Um, so we'll go into the anatomy. Um, I'm just going to go briefly over the anatomy because there isn't a lot of detail that's needed in terms of burns, I'd say. So we have the epidermis, so we have the three layers. So we have the epidermis, the dermis, the hypodermis, obviously, and then the subcutaneous tissue. Um, and then you obviously have the dermis, which is the adnexal structures and pro proliferating cells. These two, um, these three classifications, I have a table a bit further down, but these three classifications um, are basically how you would define specific burns. So you have superficial partial thickness burns, this is where the majority of adnexal structures are preserved. So when I say adnexal structures, I basically mean the hair follicles, the nerves, the sweat glands. Um, and then you have rapid epithelialization from 10 to 14 days. So within 10 to 14 days, you can slowly eventually get a good level of healing. Deep dermal. So this is where it does actually penetrate a bit more into the sweat glands, nerves, hair follicles um, and affect more of the dermis you get um, a slower epithelialization, so three to six weeks, so it takes much longer to heal. And then you also get a risk of hypertrophic scarring, which means that when, when the damage does heal, there is a good level of scarring and it can be quite thick. And then we would also address that a bit later. And then lastly, you have full thickness. And this is basically where all skin constituents are damaged. And this definitely, definitely requires surgery to heal, especially considering how bad it may present. Okay, oh, I should ask you this. Oh. Um, does anyone know what the causes, oh God, what the causes of burns are? A few of you said it on the chat already, but there's quite a few causes. I was planning on making this quite interactive just to ask questions. So if that doesn't suit, we can reduce. Yes. Good. So dry or wet heat, chemical. Yes, thermal chemical. Those are the main ones. And electricity. Fire. Yes, that's part of heat. Radioactivity. Cold. Yes, scalds. Scalds are basically the most common one. We'll go over that. So it causes a burns. So you get wet heat and scalds are the most common. So those are what present with um, in terms of, for instance, a really hot cup of tea or boiling hot water. And then you also have dry heat, you also have chemical, um, you also have um, electrical, radiation and cold. And I will be addressing the most common ones. OK, so thermal causes. So this is wet heat and dry heat. It's the most common. So this is 90 percent of all burns. It's related to temperature and duration of application. So, for example, um, my example with really hot tea, let's say uh, that could cause a burn. You want to assess how hot it was, or how hot the water was, and how long the patient's been exposed to whatever caused the burn. So scalds are wet heat, and they're usually partial thickness. Oh, sorry, I'm so technically challenged. Um, they're usually partial thickness. I've got a picture of that here, and that's what we discussed previously in terms of a lot of the ethnexal structures being preserved in the... Um, dermis and then you have dry thermal heat so this is caused by a flame or direct contact or radiant heat so for instance something that's really 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 hot and dry and um, these contact burns so by actual direct contact of heat um, they tend to be very deep as you can see in this picture here okay uh, chemical burns so these are five percent of burns the severity depends on chemical um, I'm actually going to go back and ask a question. So in terms of chemical burns, you can have acid or alkali burns. Um, if you don't know, just take a wild guess. Which 
burn is going to be worse. Acid or alkali burns? You have a 50-50 chance. Yes. So alkali, I think someone's put on the chat. We've got quite a few answers. Perfect. Good guesses. So yes, um, alkali burns are much worse, and we'll get into why. So severity depends on the chemical. Um, acid burns cause damage by coagulative necrosis. This is local and short-lived. So where essentially where the acid has had contact, that area will be um, exposed to coagulative necrosis. Whereas with alkali burns, you get progressive liquefactive necrosis. So this basically means that you get something called saponification. I know it's a pretty big word, but I'll go over the definition. So saponification is basically the hydrolysis of um, fats. And what happens is these alkalis can break down fat. And so even if you're exposed to an alkali burn, you can still get this progressive breakdown of fat. And this is deep and prolonged. Um, and yeah, it can be much, much worse than acid burn. And I've got a few pictures here. So this is an acid burn of the hand. And then in the eye, this is an alkali burn. And these present quite commonly. It's usually if someone's working or there's a splash of um, an irritant into the eye. and I feel like that's how a lot of chemical burns present most commonly and something to look out for. Um, how you'd manage it. Remove clothing. You definitely want to do that. And then dilution is the solution. So you want to irrigate and dilute whatever has contacted this burn. Um, with acid burns, dilution and irrigation is usually enough. With alkali burns, although dilution is the solution, there is a good chance that it, you will still get this progressive liquefactive necrosis. So you just continue diluting. But yeah, alkali burns can be quite damaging. And you can also use litmus paper to assess um, what they've come into contact with, how acidic it is and how alkali it is, um, and to assess the pH of the solution. Okay, so next is electrical burns. Um, I think someone previously put that down as a cause as well. Um, so we've got a child here, actually, who suffered an electrical burn. Um, this is a bit of a weird question, but does anyone know how they may have sustained this injury? Feel free to use the chat whilst I um, go over it. Uh, so electrical burns are 5% of burns. You have to be very careful for deep hidden injuries. You want to exclude fractures, dislocations, and usually there's an entry and exit point marks marking the path of current because electricity obviously has to has to travel in a certain direction. Um, so low voltage is stated as under a thousand volts. This is caused by domestic electricity usually. So socket plugs in the house, um, maybe a kid accidentally touching um, charging plugs and things like that. And then high voltage is usually over a thousand volts. This is extensive tissue damage. You also can get asystole and arrhythmias. You can get something called rhabdomyolysis and compartment syndrome. I can quickly go over them if um, anyone's unsure. Um, and you can also get renal failure. Um, but yeah, high voltage electrical burns can actually be quite serious. You definitely need to do ECG monitoring and serial cardiac enzymes if this occurs, just to assess for any cardiac damage. See the chat, kids. Explain a bit, please. Okay, yes, I can explain. Okay, so um, back to my question about what happened to this child. This child has most likely been chewing um, chewing a cable, and that's how they've sustained this injury. Um, and that's how you can sometimes see it present. Yes, a while. And then, okay, rhabdomyolysis and compartment syndrome. So with compartment syndrome, what happens is you get a pressure in the muscle and this, so basically this high level of electricity has caused a pressure in the muscle. And because of that pressure in the muscle, you get issues with blood flow. And so you get this buildup of pressure and then that obviously needs treatment. It's one of the complications. And then with rhabdomyolysis, um, this, is also, this is also something that's quite serious. Basically you get muscle injury and then from that muscle injury, you get a leakage of proteins and enzymes and, um, Obviously, this can have quite life-threatening effects to the body as well. Um, yeah, 
and that's something to look out for. And I've got the management a bit further down the line, so we'll go over that as well. Okay, this is something that I just very briefly have gone into in terms of the pathophysiology. It's just something you can remember. So with really, really serious burns, um, that especially are deep thickness, um, as you can see in my diagram here, there are different zones you can learn. So you have a zone of coagulation. This is where the tissue necrosis, so the coagulative necrosis we were discuss discussing, centrally occurs. Uh, sorry, you've got a mistyping here, but it's due to tissue destruction by injury. And then you get this zone outside of it, which is a zone of stasis. This can progress and increase the area of necrosis or depth of injury, depending on how bad the tissue necrosis is. So obviously when someone presents, especially if there's surgical intervention, you really want to focus on the zone of stasis and try and keep that as minimal as possible. You also get this zone of hyperemia and inflammation um, due to the increased vascular permeability. Um, obviously, you're having this in inflammatory process occurring where you're having all these inflammatory mediators being released. Um, and this occurs outside the zone of stasis. Uh, yeah, but that's just how you can remember how a burn kind of works. And then I've got a bit on the pathophysiology. So as I was discussing, so you have those inflammatory mediators causing the increased microvascular permeability and edema formation. You get this microvascular stasis and thrombosis, and this can lead to progressive injury and cell death, which is leading to the clinical deepening of the burn wound. So as you can see, that involves the zone of stasis and the zone of hyperemia. Um, what else? You also get these large burns. So as we were discussing with the total body surface area and the rule of nines if you if someone comes and they've got these really large burns and you calculate that it's over 25 to 30 percent mediators are released into the circulation and you get these systemic effects on the body so you get these burn edema so basically all this like tissue being released um, that's been burnt and then you get protein loss and this basically results in an impaired microvascular integrity because of all those endothelial cells being affected hypovolemia, and then you can also get the myocardial depression, red cell destruction, glucose intolerance. So basically, burns that are really, really bad can have very bad systemic effects. This is just going into really big detail on that. Okay, uh, I'll pose this as a question, actually. So in terms of history and exam, um, what do you think are the most important questions to ask? I'll start off with a history. I'll just wait for the chat. Or if someone wants to put their hand up. What caused it? Yeah, that's very good. Time? Yeah, definitely. Very, very, very important. So time, duration, what caused it? How long it took? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say those are like the two main questions. There's maybe one more thing, but... Yeah, that, that's definitely very, very, very important stuff. Did you wash it? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's actually very, very good, actually, what they've done. Because some people, um, especially people who obviously aren't familiar with how to deal with burns, can, they can put honestly anything on burns. You, you'll sometimes hear of people putting toothpaste on a burn or anything else. And you obviously want to take that in account with their history and find out what's been going on. Perfect. So there we go. All three of these questions have been answered on the chat, actually. So how did this happen? Time and duration, and then first aid applied. So what's been done to the burn? And then in terms of examination, what you want to find out is whether the distribution is consistent with the history, whether these two are very, very important in terms of assessing how bad the burn is. So whether there's a capillary refill, um, this could be absent in deep burns, and then sensation, this is absent in deep burns too, if it's really, really bad. So these two are very important to assess in your examination as well. Let's have a look. Perfect. Okay. So this is a bit of a fill on slide. Um, I'll obviously share my slides. Um, but I think this, the rule of nine, and then these definitions are quite important out of everything that I've discussed with you so far. And I've got a little table at the end to summarize as well. So no worries if we if we need a little repeat of this, because this took me a while to figure out as well. So in terms of depth, there are four main things you want to address um, or assess in terms of what it is. So firstly, you can get erythema which is basically just redness. And this is just where there's epidermal damage. It's very, very superficial. There's no skin loss and it heals within days without scarring. Um, yeah, 
for this you honestly would just give them some analgesia um this is probably the most easiest thing to deal with next is superficial partial thickness we've already gone over this but how it presents so this is the one where i said you have adnexal structures in the dermis um not as affected as deep partial thickness so with this one it'll come as pink moist blistered it'll blanch on pressure so when you press um you get that absence of uh, or change in color very painful and then predominantly epidermal loss but the germinal layer so deep part of the dermis is intact this is where it heals within three weeks you get minimal scarring and this is usually caused by some hot water scalds and sunburn so i've got a picture here of sunburn deep partial thickness so this is more white red with thick staining no blanching on pressure so when you press when you press it will still be quite pink um, or red you've lost the germinal layer of the epidermis and prolonged healing because you get this migration of epidermal cells from appendages and the edges so around these little parts here and then um you can get scarring and then sometimes or often you do need skin grafting because the dermis has been quite penetrated in terms of the burn and then a full thickness so this is my top picture here this is a full thickness burn this is leathery there's no sensation so when we were talking about the exam earlier the uh, no capillary refill and loss of sensation you get loss of the entire dermis um this will not heal unless there's very small unless it's very small sorry and then uh, usually you get scarring and contractures and you need skin grafting so this is more flame burns corrosive chemicals and long contact burns um i'm actually going to stay on this just because this is obviously quite a busy slide does anyone want me to repeat anything or have any questions or anything you want me to go over again because i can do that if needed just check okay, i think there's nothing on the chat so i'll carry on okay so in terms of burn severity we discussed what like the um assessing the percentage and age and whether this is over 100 but a few other things that are really really important are burn location so obviously whether the hands or feet or the genitalia are affected um age pre-existing medical conditions i think someone's got their mic on uh, medications presence of multi-system trauma and inhalation injuries so this is very serious and we will be covering this a bit further down but basically these are very very serious because this can essentially affect how the burn heals and the severity as well okay so in terms of management Oh. okay so in terms of management you've got minor burns and major burns the, these are the top things you want to do in terms of management so obviously um it different it, it really differs where you go in terms of how to manage it because different trusts and different places have their own rules but generally the first thing you always want to do is first age aid so you want to do your a b c d e approach um is everyone familiar with the a b c d e approach and what it stands for because if not i can go over it oh god yes yes you have okay perfect good okay perfect well you just use that in terms of your first aid then you've got your um management in a and e you've got your atls so that's what we do here it's basically your um adult trauma life support and then we have burns units as well oh awesome a lot of people have put all the definitions there we go you're doing my job for me awesome very good um so i've gone to the referral to burns unit because we've gone over how to manage some of the burns um you've got supportive management and whatnot but this is very very important so the referral to burns unit it oh, in most places it's um over 10 percent in children in terms of the total body surface area so if it's over 10 percent in children if it's over 15 percent in adults you definitely want to take them to a burns unit if it's the face hands feet genitalia or the perineum or major joints burns unit 
electrical burns so the ones where we were talking about being high voltage especially inhalation injuries so we're going to go over that significant pre-existing medical conditions and coexisting trauma so um whether they have things like serious blood disorders diabetes coexisting trauma um if it, if the burn happened for example in a fire and they have um, other types of trauma on top of the burn that's obviously going to be very serious and hard to manage as well and then nai so non non accidental injuries this is something you need to be very very careful of when babies if you see a baby with a burn have this in the back of your head because um boiling water and you know a few other things can sometimes come from this so investigations uh investigations that i like to start off with um in my head when i'm asked these questions so you do what's at the bedside first you do their observations you do their pulse their blood pressure their respiratory rate um check their temperature and then obviously you want to see if they have any iv access and put something in because a lot of these patients who come with really, really serious, serious burns might need fluid resuscitation. And then a few other things you need to check for. So full blood count, hematocrit, group and save, because some of them might need blood, use and ease, ABGs, use and ease, because um, when I discuss things like rhabdomyolysis and a few other things, really, really, really bad burns that have systemic effects can affect your kidneys. And then a coagulation screen as well, just to see what's going on with the blood. Um, You'd also weigh the patient. You'd estimate the area of the burn using the rule of nines that we discussed. And then you initiate fluid resuscitation when we discuss the total body surface area. So over 10% and over 15% affected in children and adults. Um, you'd also catheterize just to see their urine outputs. And you want to keep it at over 0.5 milliliters per kilogram body weight. Hence why you're weighing them. Um, I know this is quite a lot of numbers, but you can definitely go over this when you get the slides. <laughs> Okay, so see the chat somewhere. Yes, yes. What have I put? Yes. Is it use and ease? Um, so use and ease. I think that's what you're asking for. Is um, uh, urea and electrolytes. So you're measuring their kidney function. GNS. I'm so sorry. I'm. Uh, thank you for asking. I I totally forgot to go over this. So GNS is a group and save. This is basically where you take some blood from the patient and you use it um, to have on record just in case the patient needs bloods, um, if that makes sense. So you can give them bloods in future. Yeah, I think that's everything. U UO stands for urine output. I'm really sorry, I should have not used abbreviations. Um, this is obviously full, full blood count. This is respiratory rate and blood pressure. Okay, so carry on. Please, please put questions in the chat if I've missed anything else out. Okay, I wish I didn't put this here so I could have asked, but we've got a patient here. Um, although I've put this here, I've already brought up what complications can occur. Can anyone in the chat maybe tell me what's happened to this patient or what complication they might be having? I'll just wait for a second because it's it's one of the serious ones that we were discussing that could potentially present. Let's see. Airways, yep. So as we can see, the patient is intubated. So yep, the airways could definitely be affected. That's perfect. That's, yeah. Um, in terms of their body, yeah. In terms of their body, can anyone see anything? This might be a bit of a difficult and unfair question. But in terms of their body, apart from the burn, what effect it could be having potentially. Deep burn injury. Yes. So it's definitely a deep burn injury. Yep. Very good. Very good answers. So um, another thing. So this is a very deep burn injury, but what could be occurring here is a compartment injury. And this is basically where you get this buildup of pressure and Compartment syndrome is very, very easily, very, very serious. Sorry. It can be life threatening. Um, yeah. What you have to do in terms of compartment syndrome and this burnt tissue is an escherotomy. Um, because this per person has a circumfer circumferential full thickness burn of their chest 
and um, this build-up of pressure can impair their respiration and circulation. So at bedside or theatres, you do an escarotomy. This is basically where you put in a few incisions and that relieves the pressure. So you literally just, where you see these large areas of subcutaneous fat, you just put in these incisions. That helps in terms of allowing for further inflammation and um, blood circulation as well. Okay, awesome. And then here we have a leg. This person's had a very bad um, electrical burn and they've had a fasciotomy. This is basically where there's been incisions medially and laterally across the burn. And then what this does is, is it raises the fascia above the muscle. And this helps, again, in terms of allowing for inflammation and um, relieving blood circulation. One issue with this, though, is if it's missed or if it's delayed, you can get very bad myoglobinuria and a few other complications and then you'd have to give fluid resuscitation. But yeah, that's something else. And then now we've got the inhalation injury that we were previously discussing. So you can see over here, this person's got a really bad burn. You can see there's soot in their mouth. There's um, burns around the nose, singed nose hairs. And basically what happens is if there's a really, really bad burn, you get smoke. And then smoke contains all these really noxious products. So things like carbon monoxide, aldehydes and soot. Um, this is one of the most serious associated injuries. And this is very, very, very serious. Um, essentially, carbon monoxide has a really high affinity than oxygen to bind to, H, uh, to bind to blood, essentially, or your red blood cells, and can be carried around the body. And this is very, very poisonous. Um, what you do in terms of management is you put them on high flow oxygen. And what this does is it cha it allows to um, half the half life half the um, half life of carbon monoxide because it lasts for four hours in the air and then only 30 minutes in oxygen. Okay, so further investigations, especially with inhalation injuries. So you monitor the carbon monoxide blood level um, and assess whether it's over 10%, especially if it's three hours post exposure. You do an ABG, so you might find that it's under 10 in terms of the oxygen and uh, also check whether they have a metabolic, metabolic acidosis. You do a baseline chest x-ray basically to see um, how affected the lungs are in terms of the inhalation of smoke. Um, yeah, any kind of edema, all those kind of things. And then you also can allow to do fiber optic bronchoscopy. So you just put a camera in, um, I mean, a tube in, sorry. And then this allows for endo or nasal tracheal intubation. And um, supportive management is the main way to uh, address this. So you would do things like intubation, high flow oxygen, bronchoscopy, lavage. So um, just keep them ventilated, physiotherapy and very adequate IV fluid resuscitation. Um, yeah. These are some of the early complications. So you can get, again, systemic effects just because obviously if they've had an inhalation injury and severe burns, they can have systemic effects. So you want to... Um, look for all these complications so impaired renal function you can get hemoglobin urea over transfusion infection and impaired immune function pulmonary damage hence why we do the chest x-ray you can get burn encephalopathies you can also get malnutrition so this is really really serious as well this can also sometimes present later so the best thing to do is once you've addressed it um in terms of the burn put in an ng tube nice and early and give them their feeds or some kind of nutrition so I've got a slide on burn dressings because obviously some burns, depending on how bad they are, are going to need dressings. So what it does is it absorbs the exudate, it prevents colonization and um, you need to make sure it's non-adherent. These are the different types that I've been taught we use here in the UK. So primary, you get paraffin and flamazine. These sound like a lot of words, but basically these are the different types of materials. And then in terms of tertiary, you have things like gauze, J-cloths, wool and crepe. So these are more easily accessible and what are used for the less, less very serious burns that don't need surgery, if that makes sense. And then you also have biological things. Um, 
that have been used in the past occasionally. Okay, so we have uh, someone who's had a surgery here, and um, this shows grafting. So I would ask, but I think I'll just go over it. So basically what's happened is they've had a very, very serious burn. And what happens is usually if someone has a very, very, very serious deep or full thickness burn, usually when it's full thickness, you get this skin grafting that's very important. And there's two different, uh, not two, there's quite a few different types of graft. But what usually happens is you get an autograft. So that's your um, your own, like your own skin that you've taken from the patient's body, or you can get something called allografts. Um, it's in the notes of these slides when I send them to everyone. Um, but basically allografts are where they've been derived from humans or cadavers. And what happens is with some really, really serious burns, these allografts are used on the patient temporarily. So for about 10 days um, maximum. Uh, and then it's used as like a temporary measure. And then after the patient's obviously doing a bit better, then you would change over and put autographs, so the actual skin grafts. Okay. And then you have some skin substitutes. Okay. So this is with small deep burns. You can sometimes, uh, what they do, depending on where you are, but they have this thing where you can um, process the patient's skin and develop these kind of sprays, which spray keratinocytes onto areas and this is only used when the patient is either very unwell or for some reason you can't get skin grafts and these are just some skin substitutes again it's in the notes of the slides when i send them uh okay does anyone know what this is you could put it on the chat it has come up but um it might be a bit difficult but if you can explain just what you're seeing that would actually be really good as well let's see Oh, we've got some message. Contracture, perfect. Yes, so someone's put contracture. That's right, this is a contracture. And what you would do for this is you would, um, um, you'd obviously have to cut into it and then this would help in terms of the fixed deformity of the toes and then put skin grafts to remodel the shape of the foot essentially or stop the contracture um someone's put in the chat a question yes so contracture perfect what treats the, an emergency situation in home so burns with hot oil hot water and flame of fire that's very 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 good um i okay so, so to start off with hot oil hot water so basically what you would do is, is you obviously put out the fire you want to try and remove any clothing or anything that's attached, but obviously if anything's attached, you have to leave that. And then what happens is it really depends on how bad skin grafts. Yes, exactly. Um, so you, it depends on how bad the burn is. So using this table, for example, you can determine how bad the burn is. For instance, like I said, if it's a sunburn, then it's probably partial thickness, superficial dermal. And with things like that, it should be able to heal. Um, if it's second degree but partial thickness deep dermal it really depends so basically what happens is you have to assess how much of the tissue is affected and how much of the body if it's over 15 percent or um if it's over 10 to 15 percent of the total body surface area in terms of the burn then you're more likely to need skin grafts and um let's see basically yeah use skin grafts or from the patient itself, so autographs, um, and then burns dressings as well. Honestly, it really depends on the total body surface area. If it's under 10 to 15%, you can just use burns dressings, and then obviously um, analgesia, and also potentially give some kind of um, supportive management, physiotherapy eventually when it heals as well. Um, but yeah, and then I've come back to the table and this is a little table just to help you um, remember in terms of how to define or classify the different types of burns, how they look. So again, no pain with full thickness and no sensation, no capillary refill. And there we go. I know I've gone over the management quite wishy-washy, but the issue is you, it really, really, really depends um, in terms of stop sharing it really really depends in terms of how the burn presents um and how it looks because it's really really different management depending on what the burns are 
Um, and also the guidelines really, really vary depending on where it is. So once you've did, like assessed the depth and things like that, it's really about symptoma- like symptomatic relief if it's superficial and then things like cleaning the wound, emollients, so cream, um, analgesia, and then um, re- reviewing. So things like burns where they kind of present as deep deep or full thickness even with management you're just going to have to keep reviewing it and keep monitoring the patient 